Hey everyone, welcome to my day in the life series here on white coats and corgis. Most of you probably know me from Instagram or TikTok where I make helpful free content for pre-meds and talk about my journey as a first generation medical student. My mission here on YouTube is to give pre-med students all the information they need for a career in medicine. So in order to do that, I've teamed up with Med School Coach to create this series where I'm going to do a deep dive on each medical specialty. And I want to start off by saying that it can be really difficult to accumulate the number of shadowing hours you really need to be accepted into medical school. And especially nowadays, this can be really challenging. A lot of physicians aren't open to shadowing opportunities in person the way that they were before. So that is why a med school coach decided to collaborate with over 20 doctors to give you a behind the scenes look at practically every specialty that you might be interested in. And this is all completely free. You can go to shadowing.medschoolcoach.com, register for the program, and then you get to choose whichever specialties you're interested in to shadow. At the end, you can fill out a short quiz and then they'll give you a certificate of completion. That way you can count these hours on your medical school application. So this may be a little bit redundant because I did cut in some of what we were talking about just to review. Um, I think another feature of neurology, just to give an introduction, um, I was influenced as a lot of neurology residents are by the works of Oliver Sacks. So he is a neurologist who probably wrote at least 10 books or so on um, what his patient experiences were like. And um, I I myself never heard him speak, but I believe he did travel to a lot of institutions as well. It was quite popular, um, again, years ago, um, about how fascinating neurology is. And I think what stood out to me with these patients are of all the areas of medicine to have the involvement of the brain, of ability to speak or ability to move, um, being lost, seems so much more striking than any other organ system. So trying to put yourself in the footsteps of what these patients are going through, someone who's had a stroke or someone who's been diagnosed with a brain tumor, um, seems so much more moving to me than some of the other areas of, of medicine. And reading his works is something that I, I would totally recommend for anybody who is contemplating the field of neurology. Um, just to review, this is what I talked about before with the training. Um, so again, it's a, a bit more complicated than the average um, medical training in that there is the option of doing the child neurology um, program. And with that, um, not only is it confusing that you're matching early, but it's also hard to find, um, at least when I was applying, find a pediatrics program that will let you leave a year earlier than the average pediatrics um, residency. Most pediatrics residencies, again, are three years. And then you do three years of subspecialty training in like pediatric GI, or pediatric cardiology, pediatric palm. Um, that's a lot of time in one's life to be training and be, you know, a resident and a fellow. So I think, again, it's something that is um, difficult for a lot of medical students to commit to, um, whereas some other specialties are much shorter in terms of their training and you can go out and practice as an attending really um, much quicker. Um, so just something to keep in mind that child neurology, it is a five-year program. Um, adult neurology is one year of internship and three years after that of uh, general neurology. And if, if you do an adult neurology training, you get um, three months of exposure to child neurology. If you do the child neurology, you get at least one year of adult neurology. And then I did some electives again in adult neurology as well. So I felt I had a lot more exposure um, that I could take care of adults. I am certified to care for adults. The, the boards are neurology with special qualification in child neurology. So I can see both, um, but most neurologists stick to either adults or pediatrics. Again, I think that's what makes child neurology a bit unique. Um, depending on the specialty training, some child neurologists will 
see patients up until a certain age, like if they do epilepsy training, which is what I did, sometimes they'll follow the epilepsy patients into younger adulthood or sometimes even older, again, depending on what part of the country you're in and what the need is. Um, so after you do all that time of five years or six years of neurology, a lot of others will do subspecialty training where they'll do um, a fellowship in stroke or a fellowship in EEG or a fellowship in Parkinson's movement disorders. Again, it's a lot of time. So you really have to know that this is what you wanna do. This is what keeps you up at night. This is what excites you more so than you know any other field of medicine. It, it can get quite confusing um, and intimidating early on, but it's so worth it. Um, during the training, there's nowhere else I wanted to be. So my day-to-day -day life, again, I'm atypical compared to many others in medicine in that so many of us choose one concentration. We might be hospitalists and only inpatient, or we might only see patients in private practice and uh, again, like a niche like um, Parkinson's or such, depending on what part of the country. And I think um, it's very variable. Um, I think it's important to recognize you're going to go where the need is. So I practice in um, a suburban setting. So I'm outside um, all of the academic institutions where they have a lot of access to subspecialists. Where I practice, there's more of a need, I feel, for adult neurology because the patient population is such that a lot of the pediatric cases can get over to one of the bigger um, tertiary care referral centers or um, where I'm in the Northeast. So we have CHOP nearby, we have um, Children's Hospital of Boston nearby, we have um, multiple hospitals in the city nearby. So um, most of the pediatric patients I see are relatively healthy, which is really nice. And again, I think that that goes to show that some, um, there's a wide variety of what you can practice within child neurology. I think in the same with adult neurology, some, some medical students or residents, they don't look forward to seeing really sick patients. It can be quite, um, devastating to work with patients who are near death or have severe um, debilitating illnesses. Um, but there's an option here. Again, in neurology, nowadays, we're seeing patients of all different um, subtypes. So I think, again, where I practice, most of the outpatients that I see are um, headaches, epilepsy or even not even epilepsy, sometimes a single seizure um, that hasn't yet met the criteria for epilepsy, head injuries, um, and more common than anything else where I practice is um, actually neurobehavioral concerns such as evaluations for attention deficit um, and sometimes even other behavioral concerns like anxiety or maybe irritability or depression and, and Again, going through my training, I was in uh, more of an inpatient setting. I really wasn't overly exposed to disorders like attention deficit, but in the community setting, this is bread and butter. Um, depending on what part of the country you're in, um, disorders like attention deficit can be managed by different providers. So sometimes it's going to be general pediatrics, sometimes it's going to be child psychiatry, but again, I think it's all about access. So particularly where I practice, they send, the pediatricians will send their um, attention deficit patients to child neurology. So that's a lot of what I do in my day-to-day -day life um, when I'm working as an outpatient. When I work as an inpatient, I do something very different. I mainly help with the adult neurology patients. So again, in my community, we have a lot of elderly patients who suffer from stroke or suffer from other behavioral concerns. Altered mental status is a probably one of the most common reasons why we would get consulted in the hospital. So that's something that I help with, um, with my, I have, um, I work in a practice of, I believe 16 or 17 other neurologists. And so um, I'm lucky to have a lot of backup from the many adult neurologists in talking about cases and going where I'm needed. 
Um, but one of the other ways that I help in the inpatient setting is through epilepsy monitoring unit interpretation. So I did a one year, um, one year fellowship in epilepsy following my child neurology studies. And that's been so useful because probably the most common procedure that we do as neurologists is EEG interpretation. And that again is useful both in adult neurology for patients who come in whose thinking is not where it should be or child neurology in cases again of um, seizure disorders or other again changes in behavior Sometimes even abnormal sleep, we'll do EEG monitoring to look at the sleep and see if there's something else going on. So um, I do a lot of epilepsy monitoring unit interpretation, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go along. So just to review, um, the history is extremely important in making a diagnosis and assisting the patients um, in neurology, but I wanted to just put out there that um, the neurologic exam is also really crucial to figuring out what exactly is going on with the patient. In, in internal medicine, we listen to the heart, we listen to the lungs, we check the abdomen, but we don't have as precise a physical exam as we do in neurology. And it can be quite overwhelming, I think, for the third year or the fourth year medical student who comes in and has to go through all these different um, attributes of uh, trying to localize where the problem is within the brain. That's just how complex the brain is. All of these different domains are more based on observation. So it's hard, you know, for examining a baby, for example, or a toddler to go through these different aspects, but really just observing what the characteristics are of the child, whether it's, um, that they are moving symmetrically or that they're able to play with a toy a certain way, the way that they color, the way that they write, um, the way that they might point at bubbles or try and grab at a toy are, are really helpful in trying to figure out the different domains of the neurologic exam. So I put that there just as a reminder that there are multiple different domains and um, the neurologic exam is something that we might modify depending on the type of patient that we see. So in the emergency room, for example, if we're called for an acute stroke, there's a different scale that we follow to determine um, the risk of how severe a stroke might be and how we're going to act in terms of whether to give a clot busting agent such as um, the TPA medication. Um, so just what I was talking about, again, comparing the pediatric neurologic exam versus the adult neurologic exam, you might use different um, instruments. So rather than trying to do a fundoscopic exam, for example, you might make use of picture books or really just sitting down with the child, getting to their level, trying to establish good eye contact with them and establish that rapport so that you can understand what it is that's concerning, you know, maybe a three-year-old or, you know, with an eight-year-old trying again to get an understanding of what their history would be, not just listening to the family describe, for example, what a headache is, but trying to get that information from the child too. Um, there are special techniques, again, that we might use depending on what the chief complaint is. So um, I put at the bottom, for example, when we're looking for um, absence seizures, which is a common type of epilepsy in elementary school age children, you might use a, one of those old pinwheels and have them blow on it or try and blow out birthday candles. And that's um, because we're trying to provoke a typical absence seizure with hyperventilation techniques. So there are a lot of modifications to this. And I think that's one of the areas that can be, again, somewhat um, off-putting to some students when they first see neurology, but over time, as you get used to it, it's just so rewarding to be able to do a physical exam and have an idea of what's going on. So these are examples of some of the ancillary tests um, that we use um, You know, after we do the physical exam, because now we have the ability to do these um, confirmatory tests, it's really, um, we make use of them. So on the left-hand side is an example of just a, a normal CAT scan. 
Um, and on the right hand side is a, an example of a normal MRI. And I think, again, this is part of the beauty of the brain that now we're able to look at the brain um, in three dimensions with the MRI, look at the arteries, look at the veins. And again, it feels so rewarding to be able to see exactly what is going on, even though we have that physical exam and we can make our hypothesis just like a scientist would, um, being able to then sit down with a family and show them, okay, this is what we're seeing on the MRI or being able to tell them, no, we don't see anything concerning. Um, I wanted to highlight here, just as a review, the importance of the CAT scan is really restricted to emergency situations. So the most common reason one would probably get a CAT scan, all you need is a CAT scan and a blood glucose, and that's it. And that treatment can be life-saving. It can also be um, again, uh, a treatment for reversing signs of disability. So someone who comes in with um, loss of speech, inability to communicate, or um, loss of use of one side of their body, such as their hand, their arm, or their leg, to be able to quickly get that CAT scan, know that there's no contraindication to giving TPA. So the main thing that we're looking for is acute blood. Um, knowing that that's negative and then being able to push that TPA, I think, again, is really rewarding and something that I'm so excited about that we didn't really have back in the day. Times have changed that now stroke is not a death sentence or something that's always irreversible, that we can act much quicker and make a difference. Um, and so it's important to use CAT scans for that, but not overuse CAT scans. I think, um, again, there's a lot of misconceptions as to when we should order a, a CAT scan when a patient comes in. Um, you really wanna try and avoid CAT scans, again, in pediatrics in particular, because of the use of radiation. So unless somebody has a very acute change, again, for example, if they have, um, uh, a head injury um, and then they're not acting appropriately, they're really sleepy and we're trying to rule out something like a, a head injury such as skull fracture or um, a bleed again, um, things like subarachnoid hemorrhage, the worst headache of life is another reason to get a CAT scan um, or a very acute um, focal deficit. So again, meaning something on one side of the body such as acute onset uh, sensory changes or weakness, we would get a CAT scan for. Um, if we're trying to decide, you know, is there an, an intracranial infection? That's another reason why we might uh, get the CAT scan. The problem with MRIs is that um, they take longer to perform. You may not always have an MRI scanner immediately available. And the patient usually has to be able to lie still for at least 30 minutes. So in acute settings, we prefer, you know, that you get the CAT scan. But in most um, elective situations, um, it's really a better picture to get an MRI. And you can see here even the detail. I always compare the CAT scans to using a computer from the 1980s where everything's really pixelated and blurry. The MRIs um, are much easier to see the back of the brain to see again, usually um, we get MRIs in three sequences. So going from side to side of the head, front to back of the head and top to bottom of the head. So um, there's a lot of utility with um, the imaging studies, but choosing the right study is really important. Um, in babies um, also, because again, the CAT scan, you would not get a CAT scan in a baby, we'll usually try and get a head ultrasound or a neonatal ultrasound again to look for blood by putting the probe on the anterior fontanelle. Um, so that's helpful in newborn babies who come in with um, either acute onset seizures or premature babies, we do um, head ultrasound screening to look again for bleeding. Um, so I wanted to just show some examples of EEGs because again, the difference between the CAT scans, MRIs, and EEGs are that um, the reality of it is that radiologists read CAT scans and MRIs, and it's very rare that a neurologist will bill or get certified to read their own imaging and bill for it. So one of the ways of making a revenue 
for neurologists, again, are pursuing subspecialty training in electrophysiological studies, such as EEG or EMG um, electromyography nerve conduction studies. So EMG and nerve conduction studies are tests often done on older people with neuropathy, um, weakness or abnormal sensation of a hand or a foot um, that often can present an older age with diagnoses such as diabetes. Um, in EEG, I think again, what I was speaking about earlier is that EEG is almost a universally helpful test. So it can be helpful for babies who are having funny movements. It can be helpful in older patients or really sick patients in the ICU who have um, alteration of mental status where they're either unresponsive or not thinking clearly. So we'll do EEG monitoring in those patients to look for what we call silent seizures or seizures that don't necessarily have a motor component to them, but are um, still present electrographically and should be treated um, if, if we see them. Regardless, I think um, it's now known that subclinical seizures or these silent seizures can really um, have a negative impact on one's prognosis. So it's important to uh, find them and um, treat them aggressively if possible. Um, in this picture, this is a, a baseline normal healthy wake EEG. So the way we look at it is, um, I don't know if my mouse is going to show up here, but um, we have odd numbers that represent the left side of the brain and even numbers that represent the right side of the brain. And then we go from the front of the brain to the back of the brain. And there's a certain uh, field that we usually will see in a healthy, healthy um, EEG study where there are lower, faster amplitudes in the front. And, oh, sorry, sorry, okay. And um, the back, there's this very regular, almost like a McDonald's type of uh, M sinusoidal pattern called an alpha rhythm. And so we like to see this alpha rhythm. It should be about eight and a half or nine hertz. Um, this is a sign of a healthy wake state. Um, we see these uh, large amplitude uh, deflections, which are uh, motor artifact from eye blinking. And so this helps reassure us again that uh, at this second in time that there's nothing acutely worrisome going on. Usually to be more certain about um, the health of the brain, we need to keep the study on for a long amount of time. So typically we'll do a 30 minute study first and then we'll leave the study on for a day or two days or three days or longer, depending on what the need is, what the goal is of the study. So this is a little bit different than an EKG study where you put the leads on and you get one snapshot in time and then you might do halter monitoring later on. Um, I usually compare the two, but EEG, we would never leave it on for a second, partially because it takes a lot more, um, I think, time to get it on. Um, literally, you have to measure out the different dimensions of where each lead goes to, to make the, the proper pattern. I know EKGs, we used to connect them ourselves and medical students. Um, a medical student would not uh, connect an EEG. It's um, more complex in terms of the, the way the electrical, um, uh, where the connections are in terms of um, the leads. This um, EEG in particular was a, a challenge for me. I did this EEG on a 10 year old outpatient um, boy who came in for attention related concerns. So a lot of my attention deficit patients, we will get a single 30 minute EEG again to look for propensity for epilepsy because of absence seizures. We would treat that very differently than we would treat attention deficit. In fact, some of the medicines we use for attention deficit might um, increase the chance of a breakthrough seizure if somebody is at risk for that. So I did this study and it was different than the, the you know, this normal looking EEG in that I saw these really sharply contoured discharges. So I struggled with trying to understand if my patient was at risk for epilepsy or not. And I, I did discuss this case with um, many of my uh, epilepsy colleagues. Um, and we concluded that it's important again to treat the patient rather than the EEG. So in this case, this boy 
Um, he had presented, I think, over the summer and um, was having some difficulties concentrating. This was last summer, so during the height, again, of the COVID pandemic. Um, he, in the fall, um, has actually been doing really well with virtual school. And so the mother actually has no ongoing concerns at this point. Um, we did repeat the study. We did a longer 48-hour um, study. And he also had a sleep study because I think he had a history of snoring. And again, we kept seeing these frontal, um, what we would call discharges. But in this case, um, we've elected not to treat the patient with an anti-seizure medication, mainly because he's doing really well and he's never had a clinical event concerning for a seizure. So often in pediatrics, the EEGs can be a lot more challenging than in the adult setting. And I think again, even for adult epilepsy, specialists, they um, tend to shy away from pediatric EEG because there can be a lot more room for either developmental variants or just in general, um, even in healthy patients, we can see um, that the EEG doesn't have the same background as what we saw here in um, a standard um, adult patient or a, a child who's over the age of um, five years old or so. So this, this case in general um, just reminded me the importance of treating the, the patient and looking at the, the clinical history. So we will continue to follow him, but it's an example of, of uh, EEGs that sometimes will be benign or incidental findings. And you can actually see these types of discharges, I think in two to 5%, we said of of the population. So just important to remember that not everything in um, no, any area of science is always going to be black and white, yes or no. It's kind of on a spectrum, um, even with seizure disorders. So I think I might have an example of that coming up. But one of the most important um, diagnoses that we see in child neurology are febrile seizures. So knowing the clinical history of that um, again, is really important to consider the EEG because these patients too do not always go on to develop epilepsy. In fact, the majority of them do not go on to develop epilepsy, but it's another reason we would do one of these um, at least routine EEG monitorings if there was something atypical with their presentation. So an atypical or complex febrile seizure is usually defined by, um, again, having something focal. I think that's always uh, a red flag in neurology to get additional testing. If it's not symmetric, but you see something one-sided, like a patient's looking to the right or a patient has left-sided jerking, that's usually an indication for us to get further testing and to look and see is there something in one area of the brain that might put you at risk for seizure. Um, another characteristic would be if the seizure was uh, prolonged. So if it met, for example, the definition of status epilepticus, where seizure is going on and on, um, usually most seizures will stop after 30 seconds or a minute. It's rare that you'll have a prolonged seizure two minutes or longer, and that's when we begin to get worried that there might be something else going on. Um, the peak incidence of febrile seizures is in toddlers. So again, anyone over the age of five, we tend to worry about epilepsy, even if um, there is a fever, um, you have to rule out other causes first, such as an infection, um, but the main concern would be that this is typical febrile seizure of uh, a younger child. So really peak is 18 months, but um, most commonly we see them between like one and a half and two and a half years old. So this was another case now moving to the inpatient setting that we had a um, couple of months ago or so of a baby who um, had been born with an unremarkable history of full term baby who went home and on day of life four came in with respiratory arrest. And we didn't really know, at least from the neurology perspective, um, I was involved more to read the EEG, but really didn't have an etiology for why the baby had a respiratory arrest. Um, eventually an MRI was done and the MRI here um, is not similar to what we saw earlier. So their signal abnormality um, 
both on um, DWI and ADC um, correlates. So this is worrisome for a lack of oxygen to the brain in a symmetric distribution. Um, so he had come in with uh, these um, arm movements and they actually went between, sometimes they would be left-sided, sometimes they'd be right-sided, generally like a stiffening type of uh, movement. And so this is actually an example of an ongoing seizure. Um, you have to, again, try and correlate it clinically if the baby is having obvious movements that coincide with, with these events on the EEG. It's much easier to recognize it, but not all patients will have a, a direct clinical correlate. Um, what's interesting about this are these really sharply contoured uh, discharges that are going on second after second after second. Um, and you can actually see this little blip here at the bottom. This is a compressed spectral array that uh, measures how um, high the amplitudes are. Oh, my battery is running low. I don't know if you guys saw that. Um, I might have to go charge my. Um, so you can see that there's this is a one sec this is a, a 10 second clip or so of an ongoing seizure. So this baby continued to have multiple seizures um, in the first 24 hours or so um, after the respiratory arrest. He was treated with phenobarbital, which is a common medication used for uh, neonates for seizures. And then um, he did better after that in terms of at least the seizures. He was continued on phenobarbital, but he no longer had status epilepticus as um, what was displayed in this clip. So I just wanted to talk about um, a research area I think I'd mentioned at the very beginning. Um, one of the areas I became interested in as I went along in pediatric neurology uh, residency training was the interface of neurology with palliative care and what palliative care is. So I think that's another area that we don't necessarily recognize as much in um, working with patients with chronic illnesses and either neurology or some of the other um, medical subspecialties. Um, so I wanted to just put up this definition um, regarding what palliative care actually is. Um, because there's a lot of overlap with what we see in neurologic disorders. So looking at not only what the chief complaint is of the patient, but also um, if the patient's suffering from symptoms that are exacerbating the neurologic condition. So for example, someone who has cerebral palsy may have a motor deficit, um, may have spasticity, and with spasticity can come pain, can come other um, organ involvement, such as constipation, um, and also looking at the psychological domains of um, the patient's illness. And that's something, again, within neurology, I think part of what I was drawn to with it was also um, that there's a lot of overlap with psychiatry and mental health and how the patient copes with chronic illness, because um, particularly neurologic disorders can be quite devastating to one's sense of self. It's hard to separate, again, um, uh, for example, if you can't communicate with somebody, you, you can't talk with somebody and you were previously able to express yourself completely, you know, easily, and now you have either a stroke or a brain tumor affecting your language area. What is that like? How does a patient deal with this or cope with it? Um, and so the coping uh, really encouraged me to learn more about what palliative care is. And I've come across now that there's um, another subspecialty training um, in palliative care for neurologists as well as palliative care, you know, in general for anyone who's interested in it. So I just wanted to put up here that part of that goal of um, looking at a patient in terms of what palliative care is, is to try and ensure the best possible quality of life for a patient who has a chronic illness or a life limiting illness. Um, one of the things I came across in pediatric neurology training was when looking at the literature for palliative care within younger patients, um, genetic and congenital disorders are where most of the need is, not oncology, which was quite striking to me. Again, I think traditionally when we talk about palliative care end of life, we think about um, chronic uh, patients who are suffering from cancer. But if you actually look at the literature, at least in younger patients, um, a lot of the need is in the neonatal population, in patients who are born with 
uh, congenital, um, either genetic concerns, which again, in pediatric neurology, um, one of the other ancillary tests that we have now that we didn't have even a decade or two ago are the advent of all the genetic testing that we're able to do. We're now able to sequence the whole exome and really isolate what the um, inciting factor is for why a child may not develop as expected and be able to give more prognostic information to families of similar patients who have been reported in the literature and what they might expect in terms of long-term outcomes. Um, I came across a slide by um, Eli Diamond, who is somebody I worked with um, during a rotation in uh, neuro-oncology, um, which talks about the uh, over, overview of um, palliative care providers and what their roles are compared to um, neuro-oncology providers and how, again, the interface of how we all need to work together and review what the definitions are of palliative care and how to go about referring patients for um, this area. So I thought that was an interesting um, graphic just to share. Um, part of the, the key component here is um, improving communication between physicians and families. So I think, you know, again, going back to why I did neurology, part of it was just also of any illnesses that I could imagine having to cope with, again, for my, my own family members, at least, the neurologic disorder seemed the most debilitating, the most difficult to work with in terms of symptom management and talking about, again, you know, these really difficult discussions. When do you talk about things like advanced care directives or DNR? I think a lot of physicians have difficulty with talking about um, these really scary you no know, wow. questions. So this was something that really became important to me in my training and something that um, I do wish I could do more with, um, you know, even today. 